So what I want to talk about, you know, I, I used to call it big data versus old data. Then I thought, no, nah, it's not really old data. It's probably more like classic. If you think of a better term, uh, tell me, on, on data that is not big. So we'll talk about big data, but I really want to tell you that while you, while you listen to me, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that you might think are irrelevant. Big data, why am I talking about big data, you know, on, on, on a conference on Rapid Miner in particular. I'm going to talk a little bit about this chief data officer role, which started out in the technology world at Yahoo when I first did it. Uh, when we did it, I thought we thought it was just a cute name. I never realized it was going to take off and like become a standard in all the banks and all the telcos and so forth. Uh, but the reason you should care is it's all about where the data is, where the data is going to live, and what does that mean to you uh, if you're thinking about or you are a user of, of Rapid Miner, which I think the story is there uh, really good. Uh, I'll talk about uh, data mining and predictive analytics over, over that big data, uh, and I'll use a couple of case studies, and then my own sort of lessons learned, summaries, and conclusion, and we'll try to do this within the 50 minutes. So what matters in the end? What matters in the end is not sort of the ability to mine data. What matters in the end is what do you do with the analytics? And I use this here for insights as well as actions, as well as predictive uh, analytics. Can you get it to be useful across the organization? Whether you're in government or you're in a, a company or a big enterprise, uh, can you make sure everybody's using it? Because it's really transformative in places where data is done right. And does it drive significant business value or scientific value or governance value, whatever your, your field is, right? Those are the things that really, really matter in the end. So after we talk about uh, data mining and so forth, we'll come back and talk about how do we make it work. So big data. Uh, new term, old term. The associated term is, is data scientist. I'm sure everybody wants to be a data scientist because it's the highest paying position in computer science today. Uh, even according to places like the United Nations, <laughs> they talk about this. I don't know what their business is talking about big data salaries, but... Um, so what is big data? Uh, it's really a, a mix of the old, the familiar, the classical, the structured, relational, with the semi-structured and unstructured. The problem here is this mix is breaking all sorts of barriers for traditional relational database storage, right? Be it the columnar representation or the, the rows, be it, um, you know, how, how you would address that data, and we'll talk about some of that. Uh, and it leads, in general, to a messy situation with nobody knowing what to do, so people go on these data expeditions, hence I like the term data scientist. Uh, you really don't know what you're going to do at the end of it. You always find something useful. Uh, but it's probably different than what you went into the expedition thinking about. So I, I think it's an apt term. So let me talk about the four V's of big data. You probably all heard about the three V's, and I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on them. Volume, yes, and that's the easiest one. Lots of data. Okay, great. Velocity, that's where it gets a bit more challenging. What happens if the data arrives at a high rate? What happens if I have to be on top of it and respond in seconds, in milliseconds? Uh, in, in the uh, advertising market, you basically have 50 milliseconds, right, to compete on an impression. So imagine a continuous uh, auction that's running with every ad impression. So this is a page. An impression is just the place where you put an ad on a page, right? So every page view typically has four or five impressions. Every one of them, there's a, 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 a race happening an auction that says within 50 milliseconds you're supposed to analyze it and make a decision how much you're going to bid on this impression and the machine will sell it to the uh, highest bidder making them pay the second price. So uh, that is a place where velocity matters a lot, right? Uh, and there's no sort of going back in time. Uh, I've worked in places where you can't go back in, in the sense that if you don't process the data right you can never recover, meaning <laughs> Uh, at Yahoo, we processed, at, at my time, it used to take us almost exactly 24 hours to get a whole day's worth of data processed, right? About 25 terabytes of data. I'm sure it's a lot more today. 
So what happens if you mess up and you have to reprocess? Good luck, because the next day is coming, and it's another 25 terabyte, and the next day after it, and so forth. So you have to be robust against those things. Variety is the most evil one. That's the hardest one. We really don't know how to deal with variety, and I'll spend some time uh, about variety. And this includes things like you know, blobs and clubs. So do you know what I'm talking about when I say a blob? What does a blob stand for in the database world? Yes, not big, <laughs> binary. Binary large object, right? This is just database, database geek speak for I don't even know what the hell is inside this field, <laughs> right? And therefore, the query optimizer, the planner, all of these guys don't know what to do with it because I don't understand what it is. It's not a number, it's not a, okay? So it could be an image. It could be a club, which is a character large object. Another word, I don't know why they had to come up with it, for document, right? So a document is represented as a, a club. Uh, and, and essentially, you, you're lost when you have these fields. The database, the whole power of a database and, and that framework uh, no longer helps you. So here's classic data. This is big, but not big data. So this is what we had about every consumer or every user at Yahoo, about 600 million of them at the time I left. I think they're up to 700 million now. 2,500 fields about every user. That basically says your age, where do, you, where do, you, do we think you live, what do we think your interests are based on things like searches and what you browse on the Yahoo network, all that good stuff. So you can imagine these long vectors. And a lot of people used to look at this back in 2004 and say, wow, or 2008, this is huge, right? This is amazing. But I say, this is only the beginning, right? So if you look at that same data, and we'll talk about this example a bit later, but think about what I could do with it today so easily today with all the connectors and things like that. So there's something called LinkedIn where I can pull in all sorts of information about where you live and where you work, all sorts of stuff about your, your job. Uh, there is something called Google where it gives me a hell of a lot about you know, search behavior and so forth on, on what you do. Uh, there's a social graph. I'm sure a lot of you heard of Facebook. Uh, a pretty scary thing if you ask me. Um, but I can actually pull all sorts of other kinds of information with a whole new orthogonal dimension called the social graph. And this is, this is an exercise in a startup I did two, two years, three years after I left Yahoo. I gave this exercise for a, a summer project uh, for two interns from France. And I said, can you infer, right? So we were grappling with, this is an offers. Uh, site where it's supposed to do a mobile search engine for offers and figure out what offers are interesting to you and make them pop up at the right time. And we thought that Twitter was very informative about this, but you know, is, it, is Facebook informative? And my intuition was, not really, right? I'm an early Facebook user because I started using it when it first came out since I was at Yahoo and I had to get on top of these things. So I have, I don't know, today I have, I don't know, a few thousand, I lost count, friends, quote unquote. Uh, and they, they, <laughs> they hear a lot from me because every time I tweet, it shows up on my Facebook and they respond to it. Of course, I never see the responses because these days I never log in. And in my past, I did a few likes. That's all, like a few likes. Then I said, you know, this is not for me. Now, here's the shocking thing. These, th these guys went to my Facebook profile and came back with a commercial profile for Usama. And that commercial profile was scarily accurate. Like, what am I likely to like? What am I likely to buy? What kind of brands will trigger my interest? And how do you think they got that? From somebody who hasn't used Facebook really in many, many, many years. How did they get it? Your from your friends. Actually, in particular, from the likes of my friends. And I say friends in quotes, right? Because I don't know 90% of these people, right? <laughs> but, but somehow, <laughs> somehow they, they were able to infer that from the likes of people who are connected to me. Okay, you've heard about YouTube and, and Flickr and that's all changing actually the whole uh, world. So I can pull out pictures, I can pull out videos, I can pull out all sorts of unstructured data about you. There's a whole wealth of meta tags and so forth that nobody talks about in, in, the, in the web and in the deep web. 
And finally, there's stuff that people publish, right? People write about the locale, about the news, about where you live, about what you do, about the things you like, all that kind of stuff. So look at what just happened. I took a dizzying data set to begin with, and now it's a truly big data set. Why? Because it's a mix of structured, semi-structured, unstructured, right? And it's huge, and it's coming at a big rate. You know, good luck keeping up with, with updating this thing. OK, so my claim is that the distinction between big data and classic data is fast disappearing. In fact, you can take any traditional, highly structured data set today, data set about employees, data set about customers, and you can quickly enhance it with all these data sources. And suddenly, you've got a big data problem on your hands, even though you think you're sort of innocently working on a small data. And this is what's happening, or on a classical data set, this is what's happening to most organizations, right? They basically say, well, we don't care. We're not going to model this. Suddenly, the competitor starts modeling your interactions on social media or other information uh, that augments uh, information about the product, about reputation, et cetera, and, and they're lost. Uh, now, of course, the hidden little dirty secret is that the biggest driver for all of this is text, right? So you've all used, I'm sure you've used Google image search. Right? You type in a keyword, set of keywords, and it pulls up these images, and somehow they're relevant. So do you think Google has an understanding of the images? A lot of people, by the way, think Google is a bunch of geniuses. Oh, they must have technology. They really analyze the photos, and they understand the content. Right? All they look at is the text surrounding those images. To date, nobody has cracked. Nobody has cracked this problem. If I give you an image of a bunch of people, just tell me whether, A, a tell me it's a bunch of people to begin with. Then tell me whether it's a party, or is it a sad occasion, like a funeral, or is it a good thing or a bad thing, right? Hardly any understanding of what these images mean, right? So a lot of this uh, is driven by text, and this is why MapReduce, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, became really big. So many applications for big data, they're not in surprising places. IT and log, uh, IT logs and security. Why do you think I put this at, at the beginning, right? IT log and security data. Who do you think is the biggest, sexiest big data company today? Who? The NSA. <laughs> NSA? No, that's not a company. <laughs> and I don't. Yes, Splunk. Splunk. The only place. The only place where investors have made money on big data so far. Many more are, will be coming. But Splunk. What did it start with? A whole bunch of analytics on top of IT logs, for God's sake. Application logs, right? And now it's actually the hardest company with all business people dying to have the stuff. So this, this stuff is exciting that you're working on. You know, don't, don't give up hope. Uh, anyway, uh, all sorts of places ranging, and we'll talk about Hadoop in a, in a second too. But let me talk about this chief data officer thing, right? Now that I've been at it. You know, I did it once at Yahoo. I thought never again. Somehow I wound up at Barclays for, uh, we'll talk about it if we, have, if we ever have time. Why are companies creating this position? And why am I telling you about it? So there's a fundamental re realization that data has business value. Sounds obvious to all of you guys. To many businesses, it's not. To many business leaders, data is just a side effect, right? It's something that gets spewed out as a result of operations. It's something that must be captured. All I see is budgets, requests from IT saying we need more disk and we need more processors. God knows what it's doing, right? But there's now an understanding that no, this thing is actually very valuable. In fact, this is how my whole journey at Yahoo started with the executive team calling me and saying we want data to have an exec a voice at the executive table. We want you to actually participate in deciding where the company goes based on this. And that actually opened up my eyes to a whole bunch of possibilities. Now it's becoming more and more uh, accepted. Uh, and, and data for, for a very large organization, if you do data right, it's one of the ways you can unify a very large enterprise and you can unlock a lot of value. What does that mean? B big company means fragmented, means data all over the place, means groups and divisions don't talk to each other. Uh, in fact, at Yahoo, and I'll talk about this case, when I joined Yahoo in 2004, uh, I used to call it a loosely coupled confederation of independent states. Because if you work in Yahoo Mail, why would you ever care about Yahoo News? 
or Yahoo Autos, right? It doesn't matter. My world is mail. My whole view of the world is around reporting around the product, right? We actually flipped that company around and created customer-centric views of the data that suddenly allowed the mail guys to realize that they can get a hell of a lot more value for their inventory simply by being able to quickly answer the question, well, how many of these male viewers are actually interested in buying a car in the next three months? How many are looking for a mortgage? How many want a credit card? So suddenly they can sell those same ads for 10 times to 100 times the value, literally. And that's when they opened up their eyes and started saying, well, we got to work with all these other heads of the business units, right? Because this is very valuable stuff. Same for everything else, Yahoo Finance, all these guys. All right, so traditional IT. Why isn't data function in IT, right? So I, I put some questions here with all my love and respect for my colleagues in IT, but does your IT department provide you with the data you need today as an analyst, as somebody who needs to run an analysis tool, a data mining tool? Don't bother to answer, the answer is no, because <laughs> they don't care. And I say this with all my love and respect. Actually, they don't understand what you need and why you need it this way, and why can't you use it in a normal query, blah, 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 right? Does, so the third one is, does it even have people who understand what you need to do, right? They, their view of the world is, is very, very uh, oriented towards, am I reporting? By the way, one of my missions at, uh, at Barclays is to eliminate the words, am I? I actually think they're very bad. There are thousands of people who do you know, management information reporting, and instead it should be insights, it should be deeper. Uh, understanding and so forth. So when I, when I got to the bank and I thought I'd share these with you, I came up with these axioms that to me, I thought they were very obvious. Turns out, and I'm, I might rattle through them right now, and you might think, you might think they're very obvious, but what I challenge you to ask is, in a big company, what happens? So axiom one, data gains value exponentially when you coalesce it. It loses value just as fast when you fragment it. Seems very, very obvious, right? If I know this about my customer, and I can't join it with the fact that there's this other aspect of my life, like I'm a bank and I have bank accounts, but I also have a credit card. I also deal with small businesses and so forth, and I don't fuse the data together, right? Now, if you believe that, then the next axiom comes in. Fusing data at source is the only viable way to do it. Uh, people, there are industries out there, not just cottage industries, major industries, of trying to put data together called anyway from data cleaning to cleaning up enterprise architecture to you know, all sorts of terms. And they're trying to solve what seems impossible. It seems like it could never get this bad. But after you've let these data sources run for a long time, independent of each other, putting them together is almost impossible. So the right way to do it is you do it at the source. Standardization sounds like a very regimented, and excuse me, I'm in the middle of my transition from American English to British English. So sometimes you'll see Z's, sometimes you'll see S's. So this is a standardization by British standards. Uh, it is essential. And it's not essential because you're regimented and you want to force it. It's actually the only way you avoid to become a Babylon and the only way you can get value out of the data. If the different departments and so forth talk the same language. Now here's a very scary term for you, data governance. Oh my God. Now once you standardize data, what is, what is governance and policy? Governance and policy are the tools that make sure that the mess doesn't, that it doesn't devolve into a mess almost immediately, right? So you gotta catch it, fix it, and then make sure it never gets ruined. And that's hard to do unless you create processes around it. Uh, and in banks, they're very big on things like policies. Recency matters, thanks to Michelle actually, who reminded me of this yesterday, and it's huge, right? So, in many cases, people build their data architectures around batch processing. In many, many cases, what you really care about is what is somebody looking at now, right? I just walked into a mall, right? And let's say you have offers to show me about a store that's in this mall, about an item that I care about. What good will that offer do if it showed up the next morning? Right? Which is what batch will say. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've been in the mall. Here you go. Right? I want it right there, right? And by the way, you know, you talk to direct marketers, recency is a, is a very big thing. 
You know, in, in the old, old days, even back in the 70s when computers weren't that big, they had something. Do you guys remember direct marketing? <laughs> what were the three letters that mattered a lot? I'll give you two of the three. RM, RFM. Recency, frequency, monetary, right? So they understood the importance of recency that, you know, if, if you just bought a bunch of things and a bunch of other things go with them, the time to respond is quickly, and, and that goes down very quickly. Data infrastructure needs, I'm not going to bore you with these, but it's important to think about encryption, access to this data so that you don't get in trouble, and rapid renewal and, and modernization. These data infrastructures are changing so fast that if you commit to one product or another, you're in trouble. So you need to create the right level of abstraction and never talk to the base systems uh, at base. And finally, and we'll share these slides, by the way, data is primary competency and not a side sideshow. These are things that are not, you know, typical IT departments are not designed for. Companies don't normally think about, which is why the role of the chief data officer makes, makes a huge difference. Because if you don't have these right, uh, you'll never get data right. Okay. So now let's uh, shift gears and go quickly through th some, uh, some, some stories and some issues. I want to go into the uh, case studies. All right, so here's a valid question. People are saying stuff about my company online. I'd like to understand you know, the sentiment analysis. What are they saying, right? So you work in a marketing department and you say, okay, let me find some tools and you download some tools and you look around. Here's something I borrowed from someone. The acknowledgement is in the slides. And it says, here, here you go. Here's a graph of the tweets about your company and what people are saying about it. And by the way, you can actually navigate your way around this thing and fascinate yourself by rotating it, right? But what the hell do you get out of it, right? Then your next question is, well, surely somebody must be around who's going to like help me hold my hand, consult with me, etc., and, and help me understand what goes on. And this is an old chart. This is actually two and a half years old now. But I keep using it because this chart now, I should update it because the chart now is much larger. These are all companies that are out there that supposedly could help you figure out what to do with social media. And honestly, honestly, I, I, can't, I can't recommend a single one yet. This is how fragmented this is. And this is how important this space is, by the way. So what do technology people worry about? What are they, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's the discussion about this in technology world? Well, it's to Hadoop or not to Hadoop. Right? So uh, when, when can we use MapReduce because it's cool, right? I want to use parallelization. You know, that's, that's the banter that goes on. It's not tied to what the business value uh, needs to be. And there's an over-fascination with MapReduce itself. In fact, Hadoop got created primarily to make MapReduce, which is a way to take an operation, break it down into a whole bunch of small ones, execute it in parallel, bring back the results together. If you're the kind of company that has to maintain a copy of the entire web, a fresh copy, meaning you have to update it by the minute or by the hour, and then re-index it, count the words in every document and so forth, like Google or Yahoo or Microsoft, then you absolutely need this, right? And Hadoop came out with a lot of help from, uh, from Yahoo in, in my days there. Uh, so we make that easy, but really the biggest driver for it, and this is where we get into uh, the topics that should matter to you, is why are enterprises picking this up in droves? And this is where it starts touching you. Cost of storage, right? 100K per terabyte per year is how much it costs a bank to keep data on terabyte, on teradata, sorry. Okay, N nothing bad against teradata. Amazing company, great product, right? What's the cost on Hadoop to do this? How much do you think a terabyte of data on Hadoop costs? Zero. Zero? No. <laughs> you got to pay for the disk. <laughs> All right. It's about 2.5K, <laughs> right? And dropping fast, right? Because they use commodity storage, but they use it in such a way that it actually gives you high performance. Now, if you're in a, if you're in a company, if you care about finances, if you're in the government, if you're anywhere, if you're watching costs, this is huge. You can't ignore this, right? So that's one big driver. We'll get to the second big driver uh, of the, the stuff. I'm going to skip these slides. Uh, this, these slides talk about Hadoop and where it's used in different areas. 
the different technologies. You guys are probably very familiar on the stuff on the left. There's a whole alphabet soup, which is actually now dated on the right, uh, of, of the, the Hadoop stack. Uh, probably Mahout would be the closest that you guys would, would use here, which is uh, some of the data mining algorithms coded in, in Hadoop. Hive is the way to do SQL on top of it and so forth. Uh, this is a chart that I decided to keep here because it scares me. <laughs> right? And this one, again, this one is two years old. Uh, I should update it. So there's the relational world on the right. There's the non-relational world on the left. And there's all these terms. You know, it's my business to actually understand these, and a lot of them I don't even understand. And, you know, I've been trying to keep up because we're, we're doing huge investments into the Hadoop area with the whole evolving Hadoop stack now, and it's a whole series of alphabet soup uh, of stuff to keep up with. My point is, it's very, it's very, very confusing today. Even the experts don't know what's happening here, which is why it's an opportunity for this community because you know how to get value out of data. And at the end, that's what the business cares about, not this stuff, right? So we'll talk about that. Uh, so if storage is the biggest driver, I want to ask for a guess here. What would be the second biggest driver for why big companies would care about Hadoop? Any guesses? Loss of the data. What? The loss of the data. The? Not being able to utilize it before you lose it. Not be able to utilize it before you use it? Not quite. Like how fast can you give answers? How fast can you give answers? You think that's the answer? It's not. Cost. <laughs> fast? No. The cost. Cost. We said cost. Storage cost. Yeah. Cost is related to this answer, but you didn't quite get it. Ease of access. Ease of access. Coming closer. Coming closer. It's called ETL. Extract, transform, and load. A whole industry exists out there with huge licensing fees being paid to companies like Ab Initio, Informatica, Data Stage, what have you, right? And it turns out Hadoop allows you to do all sorts of uh, ETL much faster, much cheaper. Uh, why am I, and again, this is not as relevant to you. I guess it is relevant in some cases. But the combination of those two, those two forces, which are huge in, in normal IT, is resulting in a, in a phenomenon that says data, like it or not, is somehow winding up on Hadoop. Usually before it goes into the, the warehouse, or in the case where you're replacing things like Teradata, instead of the warehouse. So that's why there's, there's good news for us here. So I talked about, and I'm, I'm going to come, I'm going to close all this together in a second. So we talked about the three Vs of big data. Um, the fourth V is value, right? And I'm going to use a couple of examples before we launch into how this relates to Hadoop, uh, to uh, RapidMiner, sorry. Uh, understanding context and content. What are the appropriate actions? Is it okay to associate me, with my brand with this content? Is content sad, happy, etc., right? So understanding the context. Understanding the community sentiment, right? Understanding the customer intent which is ultimately what you would do if you're going to market to them. If you really figure out what are they trying to achieve and can we predict what they want to do next, whether it's buy or learn or maintain or whatever, right? Uh, so that's how, that's the fourth V to me in big data. It actually enables a lot of these things which are very hard in the old classical data world. So. Uh, and, and there's a list here of, of course, predictive analytics, the different applications. And I don't need to tell you about this because you'll hear about it in the next couple of days, so we're not going to spend much time on this. Point is, many, many fields, many applications, and the beauty of it is almost all of them use the same algorithms when it comes to data mining and predictive analytics, right? A data mining algorithm is a data mining algorithm is a data mining algorithm. So now let's talk about a couple of case studies to illustrate these and make them real. So let me start with understanding context. Question to you. Who is the company today on the web that you think of as sort of the super best at understanding web, web content? Google. Yeah, Google. Not a very hard, uh, by the way, it's their 10 year anniversary to their IPO. They are worth more money than uh, companies like IBM, Microsoft, etc. It's pretty scary. Uh, lot of, uh, a lot of wealth they generated. 
Um, so Google sells ads. Here's an article. Body parts delivered to Michigan home. This is a real snapshot. It's old. Every time I use these slides, Google keeps changing their algorithm, so I, I just froze them in time, right? <laughs> what ad would you place here? Here's a challenge to you. <laughs> right? Casket. Huh? Casket. Casket. Casket ad. That actually would be <laughs> that wouldn't be bad. Or maybe you know, somewhere for, for grievance, etc. So what ad does Google place? By the way, when, when, you think, <laughs> when you think about it, it's not irrelevant, right? I mean, parts, home, delivered, right? All keywords. And that's what these algorithms do. This is what I need you to keep in mind. These guys don't even understand what's in a document, right? It's just a question of frequency of words and, and where they fit in. And how does it fit with my ad inventory, right? So the question now is, you know, is this damaging to the brand of your advertiser? Right? Would you want your ad placed in an article like this? Uh, here's another. Violence continues. As you can tell, this is old, of course, now. Uh, in Greece, as rioters firebomb buildings. So what ad would you place here? Fire insurance. Fire insurance? <laughs> Maybe travel insurance? What else? So what did Google place here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Win a mini break in gorgeous Greece. <laughs> so, <laughs> so guys, the, the, the point here is not to make fun of Google, because I have huge respect for what they do. right? And any other company is going to get caught here. But what I'm trying to point out to you is even a giant worth $390 billion in market cap right, has challenges with this problem. And by the way, it's a sad, sad statement about the human condition today. Right? This is where we are today with the web. Right? And this is one of the best, smartest companies out there. I'll be the first to say it, right? even though you know, in, the, in the past I was at their competitors. Uh, then, of course, there's the completely irrelevant stuff. Um, so I'll mention here one company, for example. I'm, I'm on their advisory board, uh, Netseer. So these guys are tackling the same problem Google is tackling, but they're tackling it at depth. right? So. Uh, for example, they'll understand things like this caffeine article is positive about caffeine, not negative, and therefore it's okay to show an ad for caffeine versus if it's not. Uh, here's a question for you. Nail gun, insanely fast Java. What ad would you place here? Okay, Google puts in the nail gun there, right? And if you look at the Netseer uh, hierarchy about this page. It says programming in Java, Java development kit, Sun Java, Java programmers, blah, 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 blah. And, and nowhere does it fall in trap of this thing, tools or nail guns or whatever, right? Because they, they, when you analyze it enough, and the reason I use this example is to show the problem is solvable. It just needs analysis and depth, and you, you can get there, right? Uh, case study two, I wanted to talk a little bit about Yahoo predictive modeling that we did there. Uh, and, and share with you some lessons here that, that are very relevant uh, for your use of, of Rapid Miner. Uh, so in my time, it was 600 million users, one of the largest uh, destinations on, on the web. It's still there. Uh, 25 terabytes of day representing all these behaviors. Uh, by the way, here's another alternative representation. You know, instead of counting the terabytes per day, is how many events, right? So this, this would be 14, you know, 14 uh, billion events a day in, in my time. It's much larger, right? Compare that with things like Saber, which is the travel reservation system, Visa, New York Stock Exchange, etc. So, by number of events, it's pretty overwhelming. It's huge, right? So, behavioral targeting. What is that? So, that's the tool we used to basically say it's not about what page you're viewing. It's about what you're interested in. So, by looking at what you search on. Uh, what content you browse on the network, etc. And now you land somewhere where you know, half the Yahoo inventory is on Yahoo Mail. Yahoo Mail doesn't tell you much about what ad you should show. But if I knew you were looking for a car, or if I knew you were looking for a mortgage, etc., I can charge a lot more for that ad. Right? Sounds like a very simple proposition if you've got your data right and if you've done your models correctly. So what did we do here? We used that vector that we talked about. So the first thing I did at Yahoo was to simplify the vector and to put a hell of a lot of QA around it. Right? So guarantees of, of uh, 
quality. That when I say this person is interested in sport, the information that that guess is based on is recent, it's correct, it's blah, 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 right? All that stuff. And you need a lot of uh, technology around it to make sure that that's because at the end of the day, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, you know, somebody may have been interested in a car two years ago, so what, right? Um, and here's how it works, right? So you uh, take a look at these different categories. You build a predictive model for each one of them. Uh, so the, 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 the ones we sold actively in the market were 300 categories. Each one of them had a model built sometimes several times a day, often once a day. Uh, and that model is fitted to the data. Then you have to score all these users, right? So you're ready to use the data uh, live. Uh, and once it's scored, you start targeting them when you see them, right? So that you can serve up the right ads to them right away, right? So that's the setup. Uh, how, how does it work? Well, recency is, is a big deal. So for example, you, you're actively looking for a car. And the statistics say, you know, the more you're looking at car sites, the more interested you are in the car, right? So this guy is now all about the cars, right? Cars, cars, cars. Then what happens? What do you think happens? Yes, you, you, you buy the damn car, <laughs> or the digital camera, or whatever. It doesn't have to be a long cycle, right? And suddenly, you become effectively anti-correlated, right? No longer interested. I made my commitment, I'm done. Right? I might be interested now in things like maintenance and other things, but you know, I don't want to buy a new car or a new camera, right? Uh, or get a new cell, fo a cell phone plan, etc. So that ability, and this is where I challenge you, this is where pragmatism has to come hand in hand with being very good at modeling and understanding the real world says, it doesn't matter what the statistics says, because the number here, right at that point where this damn thing drops off, the statistics are screaming at you, this guy is all about this product, right? But in reality, there's an event that changes everything. And typically, you don't see that event. You don't know they bought, right? So how do we age these models correctly? And how do we do it at, at the scale of hundreds of models to thousands of models a day, right? And how do you manage these models? How do you detect when they need the refresh? How often? When do you trigger these things, right? Uh, here's the result, for example, on uh, automobile and tenders, just to show how, how accurate we were. The test results by targeting these guys with ads on other parts of Yahoo Network outside Yahoo Autos were a 900% conversion lift. Now, conversion wasn't buying a car in this case. It was doing certain acts, like downloading a brochure or doing something on the site of this uh, Euro uh, automobile manufacturer. I guess it's safe to tell you this was BMW now, many years later. Um, uh, the other one here is back, back in the day when people used to take out mortgages. <laughs> uh, so these are, for example, the uh, CTR lifts. You know, you can get people by targeting them. 122% lift on CTR, but what's more important is the stuff on the right. 600%, in this case, conversion, meaning they actually took out a loan, right? So the, the algorithms are pretty scary and, and good. And this is only looking at data you have on your behavior on Yahoo. Now think about your behavior on Yahoo. What the hell do you do on Yahoo to tell them that you really want a mortgage? Right? You, you might think, not much. <laughs> right? It's not obvious. So a lot of this data is, is subtle, but it's very, very predictive. OK, uh, so uh, experiences and lessons here. Dealing with one of the largest uh, uh, data sources. The behavioral targeting business I just described to you, so that those little tricks took the business from 20 million to about 400 million in about three years. Right? Selling the same inventory at much, much higher prices. But we had to do a lot to make it sellable. Right? We had to generate insights that go along with it so that the sales guys can actually tell the advertiser, here's what happened. Here's the results. Here are characteristics of people who viewed these ads. Here's what happens when you don't serve a campaign. All that paraphernalia that goes around the core modeling, which is also critical to, to making it work. Um, a lot more data than qualified people. This is the good news for people in this room. Right? So the hardest part is, is building the right team and retaining people. By the way, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that graduates of this team are actually the people who launched all the, a lot of the companies that went to IPO, you know, like Rocket Fuel and many of these guys used to be actually in, in, in this team. 
Uh, but we drove the data efforts by the business needs. So it was always driven by what value does it deliver, what's the biggest needle mover, and then do some deep analytics, predictive modeling to show uh, how it realizes it. So rapid manner and big data. Why did I talk about, about all this? Uh, well, you heard from, uh, I guess, Ingo mentioned it, but tomorrow you'll, you'll hear directly uh, from uh, Radoop, which, which is the real story here. So you know this about Rapid Miner, uh, lots of downloads. To me, this number blows me away, the 30,000. I think it's up to 40,000 now. I, I can't keep up. But to me, 30,000 downloads per month. Now, I want you to, to pause and think about this for a second. Like I was saying it this morning. These are not downloads of like Candy Crusher or some game. <laughs> right? For you to download this software, it means you really have a problem on your hand. You're trying to actually do some analysis. Right? So you have a data set, you have an issue of extracting data, and then you want to actually apply this. So this is huge. This tells you how much the demand is out there, and this tells you why something like Rapid Matter is so exciting, because they're trying to make it easy uh, for, for more people in the organization to meet this whole demand, to, to be able to use this stuff. Uh, and making it easier is the theme. You, you've all seen the, the chart here, so I don't have to go over it. Uh, what's the big data story? This is where, to me, one of the two cases that get very exciting. One of them is Radoop, and the other one is the cloud, right? So uh, data is moving naturally to Hadoop. And to me, this is why the Radoop uh, combination is a very powerful combination. Now you can run a lot of the algorithms natively on Hadoop without having to move the data around, leveraging uh, the, the infrastructure. And I really want you to remember this. Data movement, data copying, data extraction is a pain in the neck. And it's a very bad pain. It's just not, not an immediate pain. It's a long-term <coughs> chronic pain. Why? Because once you extract that data set and you have your own official copy of it for quote unquote analysis purposes, the stuff that IT hates for good reason, you have a problem. You have a data management problem. How do I keep it fresh? How do I keep up with the changes that are happening you know, upstream? Uh, you know, th this is a whole other set of stuff you have to deal with that really your time should be spent on focusing on the analytics, doing the predictions and so forth, rather than you know, did I get the data right and, and you know, did I clean it up right and all that kind of stuff. So to me, this is, this is very exciting. Going native on Hadoop with what's happening in the landscape out there is a very exciting move. Uh, so you avoid the expensive data movement. Uh, you, you leverage this naturally occurring wave of, of companies moving over and organizations moving over. And I think Hadoop is going to be much, much larger than, than people believe uh, or people know. Uh, all data analysis regimes are, are breaking down. So that's the other opportunity. And platforms like Hadoop are well suited to allow you to do that transition. You know, learning how to deal with document data, unstructured data, and so forth in the old database world is hopeless. On things like Hadoop, where you have access to things like Lucene and Solar, which are search engines that you can have out of the box running for you, uh, having things like Rapid Miner that allows you to do the analysis quickly and so forth is a huge, huge uh, advance that lets you elevate essentially the value of the analytics you do. And my observations and, and concluding remarks here, it's all about simplicity in the end, right? So can you make this thing so simple that you don't have to think about it, right? And the analogy uh, I like to use, I mean, what is, what is the most complex device most of us use in their everyday life today? Car. Car. Very good example. How did you know? <coughs> oh, I thought, shoot, am I missing, I'm missing some slides. All right, I'll jump back to the, to the car. <laughs> so I, wa I wanted to actually share with you the, the, the simple is powerful lesson here. So it's not about the deep analytics. Sometimes simple stuff is, is very, uh, is very uh, powerful. Uh, mail, Yahoo Mail. Uh, so one of their biggest problem was when somebody first opens a Yahoo account, they haven't shared it with friends. They haven't done anything with it. So they, they're likely to churn. They're not going to use it. They're going to abandon it, right? 
So this, I, I classify this under the stupid data tricks. So here's a stupid data trick. Before we did any analysis, prediction, you know, churn modeling, all the you know, formal stuff, said so let's, let's take a look at the data, right? So one of the stupid data tricks or, or observations said, when people read mail, they read news. Now, I don't understand this phenomenon. I don't know what it says about humanity either. But when you read email, you read news. So these guys came and said, what if we showed uh, news when you first log into email? OK? This simple, stupid act resulted in a three times reduction in churn. Go figure. Now, it worked for the new guys. So the mail uh, business unit got so excited, they wanted to use it for everyone. So today, if you ever log into Yahoo Mail, you'll actually always see that news module. <laughs> right? Again, all based on something I can't explain to this day. Why do people do this? <laughs> I don't know, but the data says they do this. So don't ignore the simple stuff in the data. The simple exploration can lead you to major uh, outcomes. Here's another one. Uh, actually, this was with Julie Bornstein, who was a very, very data-focused uh, marketing director at uh, Nordstrom. And you know, I, at the time, I, had, I was running my first company out of Microsoft, first startup, working with a lot of big companies. But Nordstrom was one of our more demanding clients. And she would always ask these questions that you know, we didn't think about. So in, in the web analytics, she would say, OK, great, you showed me all these graphs. But what are people searching for? but not finding on my site, right? And we said, OK, fine, special project, new feature. We did that. And we came back and said, listen, you know, there's like, during that month, there was a whole bunch of searches on belly button rings, right? And this was a new phenomenon. Suddenly, people were searching on belly button rings. But Nordstrom didn't sell belly button rings. So what did she do? Well, first of all, she actually went and investigated why. And she found out that, you know, they were running some ads where the, they were selling something else, but the models were featuring these belly button rings. So suddenly, right, th this is, by the way, they're not in that business. Suddenly, she goes back to the website and says, you know what, we're going to stock belly button rings. So she starts selling $400 belly button rings. I didn't realize they were that expensive. <laughs> but so then the offline stores actually pick up on the idea and start selling it in the store, right? So to me, that's another, another beautiful one, which is, you know, ask, ask the, the right questions, right? And now my theme about thank you for guessing the car. <laughs> so the car is the most complex device we drive today. You guys are too young to ever have lived in the days when you had to crank the engine. And if you were not an expert as to how the internal combustion engine works so that you can recover when it breaks down on the road, you had to have a driver, a professional person who took care of it and a bunch of tools, right? And what happens today? Today, it's super compelling, right? You sit in the car, and you no longer turn a key, I guess you hit a button, so we've come a long way here, and the engine starts. And inside it is probably some of the most complex engineering of our time, from how to inject fuel, to what to do when the temperature is too cold, when it's too hot, when all sorts of stuff. More computing power than you can ever imagine. All all uh, packaged in a way where it's just press of a button. And my message to you is simplicity is the key here. If you make it simple, you will actually solve a lot of these problems. With data is complicated for organizations today, too complicated. So how do we package it in a way where it becomes super simple? This is where things like accelerators in, in, in rapid minor come in. This is where, trust me, business usage comes in. If it's something you have to think about, Right? You probably won't do it, is the rule. So you have to make it so simple that people don't have to think about it. Doesn't mean you don't have to do the thinking, and you don't have to do the engineering in the background. You have to. Right? Tons of engineering goes into the car, but the product doesn't require an, an, a deep understanding of the technology. OK, so uh, some of the lessons learned, discounting the need for real time uh, is always a big gotcha for me. So nowadays, I never approach anything. Anytime I find myself trying to do anything batch, I kick myself in the butt, and I say, got to do it in streaming real time. Uh, no grid story. So did you build a data infrastructure where you suddenly instantiating a Hadoop grid is a problem? Then you're stuck. Um, 
try to eliminate as much as possible creating your own versions of the data and, and the storage and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, scoring and integration of results is where a lot of you, I bet, don't think about it, right? So you generate the model, you're super excited about it. How does it get used? And in practice, can it be deployed in a production system or in the real business? And often the story for deploying it, we don't have time for it, but I can tell you some amazing stories about what it takes to get the stuff deployed. Uh, eliminating the data extractions. Uh, think hard about whether you need MapReduce. You often do need it. And I actually really like what's happening with Redoop, where it's basically embedded. You don't have to think about it, right? It's happening. It's being used on your behalf at a higher level, which is probably the more appropriate approach. Uh, and what did I want to say? You all know this, so I don't have to repeat it, but it is the key. You know, analytics is the key. So this, at the end of the day, even if you got your data right, you got everything in place, you got the right architecture, the right governance, all of this is useless unless somebody actually does the last mile, which is how do I get predictions out of it? How do I get useful analytics out of it? Uh, and how do I uh, figure out how to deal with it? So probably this is all I wanted to say. And I will turn it over to questions since we have yeah, almost uh, five minutes ahead of time. So we have 10, ten minutes of questions. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, mobile analytics. So is it, is it using analytics on mobile, or is it actually analyzing people using mobile devices, right? It applies to both, actually. Is it the second? Yes. OK. So how hard, how hard is mobile analytics? So in, in, the, uh, in the web world, they got around the whole issue by doing cookies. Now today, nobody does cookies. Why? Yeah, basically, too many tools that get rid of cookies. Cookies are useless. You can't rely on them as an identifier. So what really happens is people figured out a way around it, as they always will. <laughs> so if you do, you do a triangulation, right? So uh, a combination of IP address, type of browser, type of machine is probably very, very good, and, and sometimes time of day, very good at actually identifying a user, believe it or not. Not by name, but that this is a unique user. Uh, the same thing is actually beginning to evolve in the world of mobile. So in the world of mobile, if you're actually approaching it, if you're at a telco, you don't have a problem because you know who the user is, and you, you can get to the EIN. But if you're, if you're not, then a lot of people are using that triangulation. And in fact, uh, because a lot of the shopping activity is also moving to mobile, a lot of the commercial searches, a lot of the stuff that we care about, is actually happening on the mobile device. So what is not solved today is the instrumentation problem. right? So on web, uh, people solve the issue through you know, web logs and things like that. On the mobile, that is still an open problem. right? And that's probably the hardest part, is how do you instrument these things? And, and the worst one is what's happening inside an app. right? So once you start running an app, if it's an iPhone, only Apple really sees what's going on. Uh, you know, people are beginning to publish some, some toolkits that allow developers to actually instrument as part of the development. And a lot of the developers are becoming in, uh, incentivized to do this instrumentation because they're realizing there's, there's no, you know, just getting people to pay for your app is too hard. So the equivalent of the advertising is, can I instrument it? Can I get data back? And then can I use that data to sell analytics or, or understanding or what have you? Uh, so today, I would say it's, it's early days. Uh, it's extremely promising because it's way more powerful than the computer, right? You, you carry the, the phone, and in my case, several phones with you anywhere you go. So it's location aware. And the semantics of location are now trivial, right? So I know when, when somebody's entering a mall. I know when they're entering a hospital. I know when they're entering. So there's a lot of richness to this data. The question is. How do you get at it? Right? And then the other one that's really, really big with me is how do you get users to opt in to this? Right? Which is the most important part, I think, ultimately. 
How do you get users to say, you know what, I actually want you to track me? And that's not impossible, by the way. Can you think of a context where users say, I, I gladly want you to track me? Yeah, Verizon Wireless is offering people thousands of points right off the bat to let them track where they're going. So give, give, give you points to let you track. Who, what else? Why you open app? What? Waze, the navigation system so bad. Waze? Which are, which are everybody's else benefits, so you're benefiting from that. Waze, yeah, it's so scary, right? They, they gamified it. And you know, you, you actually have to contribute as part of how the service works, right? If you don't actually tell it where you are at any instant, right, it can't help you. But the same by telling it, you're actually reporting your speed, your location, what's happening, all that stuff, right? Even more, more classical stuff, right? To me, uh, like airline, airline miles. You know, not only will I go out of my way to go to the to the desk and say, hey, make sure you've got the right number that you're tracking me. No, no, make sure you're also tracking my kids, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, when you actually give the consumer the right, the right consent, the right reason to say, yes, track me, and I understand that tracking me is part of the reason that you can deliver value to me, the equation is healthy. And no one can get in the way. Otherwise, there's, there's a lot of trouble that, that is brewing. I mean, the stuff, you know, when I left Yahoo, the stuff that was beginning to happen on ad networks, and, and my job at Yahoo, part of you know, data privacy and so forth was in my domain, it was becoming like a nightmare, right? And, and I, I was glad to be, in fact, in fact, out of that business because it is scary, right? The analogy I use there is, uh, you know, I think it's totally fine. You know, let's go to the physical world. My, that's the analogy I used actually in one, one of the testimonies with, with a Congress committee. If, if I walk into a mall, or I walk into a, a store, like Nordstrom, right? And the salesperson comes up to me and sort of, uh, uh, he or she looks me over, up and down, and decides very quickly, what is my age, what is my gender, what kind of clothes I wear, they quickly decide this guy is a geek, he's not really fashionable, all that stuff, right? And, and, and make decisions in order to help me. None of you would consider that an intrusion on your privacy, right? You, after all, you walked into the damn store, and you, you know, they're, they're trying to do their best to sell you. Now, if you leave Nordstrom and start walking across the mall to Macy's, and that Nordstrom salesperson starts following you, <laughs> it becomes an issue, right? And if he's standing next to you on the counter at Macy's saying, no, 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 come back, that is called web retargeting. That is called ad networks. It is scary. It is scary stuff, right? And it is out of control. Don't get me started on data privacy. Yeah. Other, other questions, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering if I could get your opinion on the whole matter of how we're going to manage to train the analytics professionals of tomorrow when you think the U.S. is producing about 2,000 whatever analytics statisticians a year, and that we need, what is it, they say, 140,000 by 2017. And in particular, I, I, you know, I, I'm at Bentley University, which is a local shop that has done that for 20 years. And I'm wondering if... Um, what you feel about corporations and academia, you know, basically working together to try to make that happen so that we avoid bidding wars, yeah. the likes of which we haven't even seen in the beginning of. So, so I was wondering if I get your take on that. Sure. You know, how we could handle that together, or, and should we handle it together? So, which I guess I think thank you, and it's a great question. In fact, it is. So first of all, it is good to be a data scientist these days for precisely these reasons. <laughs> you're, you're one of the one, not one percent, one in a million probably. Uh, but there is, there is, I mean, in all seriousness, there is a huge disruption that is happening that is extremely threatening to a lot of uh, what we thought of as very cozy careers, right? So if today you're a, if you're a traditional BI or data warehouse engineer, you know, what's going to happen to you? Right? Because the way you think of the world, the way you program, by the way, every, every few years, I try to force myself to learn something new. Right? So you know, when I moved from NASA to Microsoft, my big project was to learn C++. And then, of course, I had to learn Visual C++ and the whole Microsoft thing. And then when I moved from Microsoft to other places, I had to read, you know, I had to learn PHP. Right now, my project this year, hopefully, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but is to learn Scala. Right? which is both functional programming and essentially programming on, on Hadoop. So to answer your question now, yes, I believe there's a huge need. Uh, we signed a big contract with uh, one of the Hadoop companies 
And uh, a big part of that contract was a training budget, a huge training budget to train thousands of people to start doing this mental shift, right? I, so I, I went through this mental shift of how do I program in MapReduce. It was very unpleasant, by the way. It's really hard, right? To, to, once you're used to programming one way to like shift gears. But it's doable. You know, I, my, my theory is if I can do it, and I'm not dedicated to it full time, anybody who this is their career, they can, they can learn it. And we're betting on this. So we're trying to do this at scale. And universities right now are not helpful at all, right? We try to go to them. I try to reach out. I try to convince universities actually to even create data science programs, right? In academia, and I don't know, your university sounds a bit more advanced. In academia, and I'm on the advisory board of a couple of universities, this is very controversial. Oh, this is not traditional, right? We, let me think about it for the next 10, 15 years, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this is a problem. If we can actually get the universities to move, and they need to move, because this is how they deliver value to their constituency, right? To teach them the, the stuff that's most relevant. And that stuff is changing so fast today. This is almost like the days of the, uh, you know, the, the, the tubes switching over to semiconductors if you're an electric, enge electro electric engineer, right? God help you if that, that was your specialty, right? Power, tubes, and so forth. Uh, and you had to do the change, except here the change is, is a bit more dramatic and way faster. So uh, this, is, this is a big deal. It's a big deal for our field. And by the way, this shortage is very scary to me. The fact that there are not enough statisticians, not enough data scientists, not enough people with enough know-how and, and experience to to sort of get the, the, the right instincts around how to approach an analysis problem, right? When I see that it works for you, when PhD students get kidnapped and brought to right? Yes. And literally, and, and I think if we don't address that, you're going to get bidding wars that we can get. Absolutely. In fact, our plan at the bank is once, once we train somebody on Hadoop, how the heck do we make them sound enough forms that they're going to hang around long enough, right? Because <laughs> once they're trained, <laughs> they're a hot commodity, right? OK, sorry, there was a question here, yeah. Uh, uh, with wondering your insights, I mean, most of what people talk about big data, at least I'm prejudiced in believing, is slanted towards market. But the bigger questions in life actually exist, and was wondering how big data actually impact in areas of complex things like healthcare, pharmaceutical, drug discovery, yeah. life sciences. I mean, yeah. they have major problems. Absolutely. What, okay. what, made how, you, how exactly what made you think it's slanted towards marketing? Uh, somewhere coming from the domain of the accounting industry, life sciences, there's, there is a fear, I mean, I'm, I probably am biased, I admit. But how exactly, the question is how so, do you think So let me, let me, I mean, I have, I have a, yeah, that's a good question. So I'll answer this in two parts. So part one, my, my personal journey, right? I came at this, you know, right when I finished my PhD, my first experience was at NASA JPL, where I was applying this stuff, early data mining algorithms, to data, massive data science analysis, right? One of the things I learned quickly there was these algorithms were solving these standing problems in science, which are data analysis problems, right? The, the problem is scientists will get stuck on a problem because they're, they're wrestling with the dimensionality, right? Oh, it's got 30 variables. Now, you come to them and say, no, no, there's actually 200 variables, 500 variables, forget it. There's no modeling, there's nothing. They break down, effectively. They'll never admit it, they'll continue publishing papers, but they, they just don't address the harder problem. So there, I, what I quickly discovered was that these algorithms could help people who can, who can afford to dedicate an entire lifetime to sort of one data set. And so what's happening in the business world? Now, in those days, I would say the science world was ahead. These days, and this may explain why you, you feel this big data is more commercial, I actually think the commercial world is ahead of the science world. The science world has fallen behind for some reason in the past 10, 15 years. So the techniques being used today at large enterprises are actually more advanced than what scientists are, are deploying for their data analysis. And, and they are they should be the first, usually, right? Because they're, they're in the frontier, and they're more experimental, and they can take risks, and you know, there's no, you know. Um, so hopefully that, that catch up will happen. But yeah, no, the big data, I mean, to me, those problems, the three Vs or the four Vs, and when I say the fourth, value, the fourth V is value, 
It could be scientific value, it could be knowledge value, it could be, like I said, governance value, or it could be money. Right? So all of them are important. Uh, and I think the applications of big data actually in healthcare, again, they are commercial, but they're probably the biggest. Uh, telco and banking is, is the following ones. And banking is still in the beginning of the journey, by the way, for those of you looking for jobs or making startups. Huge opportunity. Huge. I mean, at Barclays, we actually opened an accelerator next to the bank in a cheap part of London, uh, where we're actually working with an American company, Techstars, to actually fund startups focused on financial technology, right? Because we recognize that small teams focused, you know, lean, can approach these problems and crack them much faster than a bank. And we want to benefit from that when, when, they're, when they're out there. So we're, we're funding them without even taking anything back. We give them free space and all of that, but they have to, uh, and the demand is high. I mean, we had, uh, out of our first wave, we had 350 companies apply. We selected about 11. Uh, so yeah, I think the applications are, are, are everywhere, and I think a lot of the big questions about sociology, about, you know, about the human body, about diseases, about cancer, will actually have, the, the big data will be a key. So it's not, it's not an empty term, and it's not a commercial term. It's actually a very meaningful technology. Yeah. Other questions? Time for one more. Yeah, I have one question. Yes, please. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you see the role of cloud computing and cloud infrastructure and big analytics going, big data analytics going forward? Yeah, cloud. That's a whole other talk, <laughs> which you will hear tomorrow or no? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think even Larry Allison now admits the cloud is the real thing, right? <laughs> so <laughs> um, <It's something. laughs> the. Um, Cloud computing is, 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 is here to stay. And it's a, the, the reason why you, you here in this room, this community should care about it, is ultimately what I said before, which is you have to go where the data is. So what is very interesting about cloud computing, you know, Amazon started the whole EC2, <coughs> S3, uh, Elastic Computing, which is their cloud offering for computation because they had to basically stack up on a whole bunch of processors for the Christmas season, probably when most people who you know, want to use the heavy computing don't use it because they're on break. But uh, Amazon needs it to do the processing. And then they had the extra computation free for the rest of the time. So they said, well, why can't we share this, right? And then they discovered something that's really important, which most people don't think about. And this is why they created S3, which is their storage in the cloud. Which is, OK, in order to do computation, you have to get your data there. And moving data is a very expensive thing. Physically, actually, very expensive. Charges and so forth. It's not cheap. It's not like, oh, I'll FTP a few megabytes, right? This is like you know, terabytes and more of data, petabytes. So they figured out the next gig, which is, OK, I'll rent the storage, right? So that the data will sit there. And I'll charge you for the storage forever, pretty much. Because whether you're using it or not, you're using up the storage. <laughs> Right? So EC, the, the, the elastic computing is actually a big driver for their other much more profitable business, which is a storage business. Right? So I do think this trend is there. And I think what's happening is for companies who are uncomfortable with the security story on the public cloud and the shared services, even Amazon now is trying to sell private clouds inside big enterprises. So they'll say, you know what? We are experts. We'll come and show you how to build your own. And many other companies are thinking about it. Most of the networking companies are thinking about it, too. So th this is the next move, which I think makes eminent sense for a large, any large organization. You have so many computers in the organization. And by the way, universities discovered this a long time ago. A lot of the stuff around utilizing sort of the free compute cycles on a lot of machines, especially on weekends and when people are not using them, has been around for a long time. It's just now it's coming sort of to maturity, where people are saying, if I use a cloud architecture, all of this becomes easy. So instead of having to figure out which computer is free, et cetera, it's all virtualized. It's all on my internal cloud. And the minute you don't use it, it's now available in the pool. Right? And that's a very powerful economic dimension, which will drive a lot of so, so I think cloud way of thinking is probably the right way of thinking for you know, until the next wave, God knows what it is comes on. But for now, this is only the beginning. And I think that's where everything is, is, is heading to. 
So even inside your, your own company and inside even your small company, you'll probably have a private cloud. Most of you probably have public cloud is just fine because you're not that sensitive about the data. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks.